do you remember a time or place in in your younger days when it dawned on you that uh, music was uh, going to be a career for you? Uh, well, there was a time when uh, uh, a friend of mine took me up to his manager's office when I was about fourteen, mm-hmm. and that night they sent me out on a gig with one of their bands, and uh, I realized that you know that's what I really wanted to do and I really didn't want to do anything else. Right. And within a, within a year, I was in a band that had a number one record here in America and that was it. That was the end. You were hooked. Yep. Yeah. Do you remember that uh, first feeling when you, you heard a recording that you were involved with on the radio? Uh, no. No? Not really. No, I don't. I don't remember that. There was a bunch of them around the same time, so it, it's hard to uh, uh, it's hard to say. I, I, it was very exciting. We had a, a number one record when I, as a writer uh, uh, called "This Diamond Ring." Oh, right, yeah, for Gary Lewis. Yeah, yeah, and and that was uh, the first one I ever had as a writer, and it was uh, uh, actually the only one I ever had as a writer <laughs> as a number one record. And uh, that was uh, uh, kind of fun to hear on the radio. I've read where you've actually described those years where you were doing a lot of writing and various session works as a, as a very uh, educational period for you. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, my whole, <clears throat> all my teenage years up until I was about 25 was, I would say from 15 to 25 was all education. Yeah. And and anything that happened in that time period was pretty much blind luck because I was still learning. Yeah, for sure. I know you've probably told this story a million times. It's pretty much part of uh, rock and roll folklore. But for our listeners and, and for this special, uh, we're putting. Well, to... I mean, uh, if it's the the Dylan that's the one <laughs> story, I will not be telling it. No. No, I have a moratorium on that. <laughs> I'll talk about anything but that. Oh, fair enough. Ridiculous story. I've just told it so many times. I'm fried on it. Yeah, fair enough. And uh, the the Newport show as well? Got a line no, through no, that? No, no, I don't have a problem with the Newport show. Oh, well, tell us about that one, because there's a lot of different accounts of what happened there. Well, the main thing was that um, Bob was the headliner of a, of a three-day festival. And a lot of people had come to see him play and didn't really care about anything else at the festival. So... Um, when he uh, came out, he only played for uh, three songs for about 15 minutes. And most every other act that was on the uh, festival played for between 45 minutes and an hour. So here's like all these people that came to see Bob Dylan, and all they got was 15 minutes, and they had to sit through all this stuff that they really didn't care to hear. And they were very upset. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so, you know, they they wanted more. That so wasn't so much what he was playing; it was the the, the time. The well, of time. you know, that affected more of the backstage people than it did the people in the audience, because uh, um, uh, I think the people in the audience just wanted to, you know, I'm just trying to think of something comparable, and I can't. Like if you. If you went to see, uh, I don't, you know, like I don't even know who's big now, you know, that's comparable. Yeah. But it, you know, if you went to see, like, you know, the Stones, and you know, and and uh, Guns N' Roses opened and played for an hour and fifteen minutes, and you know, U2 played and all everybody played, you know, and then the Stones came out and played for fifteen minutes, you'd lose your mind. I imagine you would, yeah. I can, I can see your point, yeah. So that, you know, so that's that's what happened, except instead of it just being like a one-day concert, it was a three-day festival, you know, and people mm-hmm. were there for three days. Waiting to see him, yeah. And uh, so I think that's what the... And then it got written about, and the, and the, the booing thing got so promulgated by the media that by the time, the next time we played was at Forest Hills, and then everybody booed because they read in the paper that's what they were supposed to do. <laughs> yeah, and then the it, the know, mob then, mentality. Yeah, and yeah. Then, I, I mean, because at that show, uh, Like a Rolling Stone was number one, and we, you know, we closed with Like a Rolling Stone, mm-hmm. and everybody 
sang along with it. And then they booed at the end. <laughs> that really told you, you know, what it was all about. Yeah. It almost felt like it was expected of them. Mm-hmm. You've worked with, you've recorded with Bob on other occasions over the years. Have you, have you noticed in that time any obvious changes to, to his approach to, to recording? Actually, it's, it's just the only thing that I can tell is, you know, based on who's ever producing. Yeah. Yeah, otherwise, uh, you know, I mean, the only subtle changes in anything are, are you know, what the producer does. Bob is pretty much the same. Yeah. When the offer came for you to, to join up with the Blues Project, were you at that time specifically looking to become a, a part of a band situation away from No, no, I was very taken by surprise. I was doing studio work, and I was quite successful with it because of Like a Rolling Stone. And a lot of people were calling me, and I was doing a lot of studio work. Mm -hmm. And I could have just stayed doing that. But uh, for some reason, I mean, I was so surprised when they asked me and I thought about it and it just seemed like a good idea so uh, I accepted right so it wasn't something you were specifically looking to get into into a band situation at all no no, no I wasn't thinking about that at all right, but after that you went on to form uh, Blood Sweat and Tears right but only there for a short time how did you feel about the musical direction that that band took after after your departure I didn't care for it no no, I mean, uh, it's probably one of the reasons I, I didn't stay, is because uh, it was kind of like building the Frankenstein monster. And then, you know, then it came to try and kill me, and uh, it just chased me away, fortunately. And, uh, but I didn't uh, uh, stand behind, you know, what the monster did after that. Right, so it, it bore no resemblance to the band you had in mind. Not at all, because, yeah. I mean, they were very jazz oriented and I was more rock and roll oriented right um you did a Rolling Stone session you played on uh, Let It Bleed yeah yeah how did that uh, come about um I was in uh uh England and Nicky Hopkins was in the United States and and they wanted to use a keyboard player so they called me cause Nicky was gone it was really that simple right some of the techniques. Oh, she also did the French horn on that too, didn't you? Yeah, that was later on, though. All oh, right. You know, not on that session. It was they sent me the tape, and I did that. Acted on later, right? Just run through a couple of others that you did around the same time. Also, uh, the Who. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, what you were on the Who's next album, wasn't it? Yeah. What tracks did you play on there? Uh, Rael, I think, is the only one that they got on the album. And then they're on the uh, the the version that they put out recently, there's a couple of other things. There's the version of uh, Marianne with the shaky hand that I played on. Uh huh. And I think one other thing I can't remember the name of it. Right. Uh, any specific memories of the Jimi Hendrix sessions? Well, I mean, it was only just one session that, uh, that was not a really great song it was not a really great session uh the best thing that happened on that session is he gave me one of his guitars all right you still have it today no i had to sell it because people kept breaking into my house you get to it so I, I got rid of it but i had it for about 22 years and it was you know a wonderful wonderful guitar of all the sessions that you you've done over the years are there any the stick out for you as ones that just didn't work that just uh, were just too bad for words. Anyone difficult, particularly difficult to work with, or? Uh, well, I was on this BB King session once, where um, the drummer and I got into an altercation, and it was a, like you know a horrible experience. And I had really been looking forward to the, to, you know, it was the first time I ever played with BB on a, on a record, you know. Yeah. And I, and I had to, like, and you know, and I was booked for about three or four days. They were making an album. And I had to, you know, like beg off after the first night because the tension was so thick between me and the drummer. And the next day they recorded The Thrill Is Gone. And you missed so out I, on that. I could have played on that. Yeah. So that, you know, that, that was probably the worst thing that ever happened <laughs> to me. Uh, now, you're also known for, for uh, discovering Leonard Skinner. Uh-huh. 
You remember the first time that uh, you saw them? And absolutely. Yeah. And tell us yeah. a bit about that. It was in a bar in uh, Atlanta, and and uh, again, you know, it was out of context. I was in some bar looking for women, and uh, there was a band playing, and uh, the last thing in the world I cared about was the band, but uh, they were playing there for a week, and little by little they got me. Yeah. Until by the end of the week, I was trying to sign them. That's the first time they'd ever played in Atlanta. It was very cosmic, the whole thing. That we both happened to be there at the same time, in the same place, and you know, and have the same taste in music. You think we got the best, see the best of them? Do you think they had probably the best work ahead of them? Yeah, I do actually. I thought you know that their their uh, last album as that particular group was quite a good record. And that they were really, you know, starting to become, you know, terrifying. Uh, that was too bad. That did cut short, you know, a, a great career. Yeah. Absolutely. I was interested to read uh, also that you knocked back an offer to play at Woodstock. Yeah. Yeah, I thought that they were charging too much money <laughs> back then. So what? For, what? The t for the tickets and everything. So what were you doing on the Woodstock weekend? Uh, I played for two bucks in Central Park in New York. And uh, what sort that was of my protest. It was your protest. What sort of a roll-up did you get? Huh? How many people turned up? Oh, you know, plenty. Yeah? Yeah. They, it was like on a Friday, I think it was a Friday night, and uh, it rained. And, uh, and so they had to reschedule it for Sunday afternoon. So we had to play again Sunday afternoon. Uh-huh. And then it was quite beautiful, and it was, uh, uh, it was nice. Uh -huh. It covered me for the whole weekend. Oh, that's good. That's not a major regret that you that you miss Woodstock. Oh, sure it is. Yeah, I think it probably changed my career radically. And uh, you moved to England for a while in in the seventies. Is that right? Uh, the very late seventies. Yeah. Um, was that a work related move? Uh, it was a curious related move. <laughs> I just wanted to you know try it out, see what it was like, and it was. Probably the worst timing of anything I'd ever done in my life, because uh, uh, you know punk was quite big, and uh, and there was a very strong uh, patriotic feeling there for uh, English organic music, mm -hmm. and uh, the last thing in the world they were interested in was you know working with somebody from America. But I mean, it, it's an interesting portfolio of things that I did while I was there. I. Uh, produced um eddie and the hot rods and <laughs> david essex <laughs> and played on uh, uh george harrison's album somewhere in england that's right you're, you're involved in a uh, a session there with the three surviving beatles at one stage weren't you yeah yeah so um uh you know th th this is quite a quite an interesting year <laughs> but uh i mean I, c I wouldn't have been able to do anything if it wasn't for uh, herbie flowers Oh yeah, yeah. He he got he got me all that work, single-handedly. He's a good lad. You're actually uh, very very well travelled, really. You've moved around a lot over the years. Would that be fair to say that the willingness to move has, has helped you work with with such a wide array of people as you have? Well, you know, I just get um, I get very static in my surroundings, and I and I I want to leave, you know, and I. I actually would like to stay in one place, but I just haven't found the one place I could stay yet. Still searching. I thought it was going to be Nashville. Yeah. But um, uh, things are changing so quickly around here that it's just not even the place that I moved to seven years ago. Right. And it's so different here that, you know, I have no desire to stay anymore. Right. So you're uh, shortly on the move again to Boston, I believe? Yeah. What's, um, what's waiting for you up there work-wise? Uh, it's well, I'm going to teach a little bit at the Berkeley School of Music. Oh, really? Yeah. I'm going to teach uh, a couple of classes a week, songwriting and record production. And um, uh, I'm going to do some work for um, this club in New York called The Bottom Line. Mm -hmm. They've started a record company. They're going to put out um, uh, concerts that have been played there over the years by, you know, various artists. Oh, tremendous. And, uh, 
and I'm going to uh, edit and master the tapes and design the packages and be responsible for the liner notes on all of that stuff. Kind of executive produce all those uh, CDs. So um, that'll keep me pretty busy. They want to put out 40 in the next two years. Oh, that's fantastic. That's and then I just sold my book. And oh, I was going to ask you about that, yeah. It's due um, March... Um, in March, so I, I have to uh, finish that. So uh, I have quite a full plate at the moment. And the book, is that like a sequel to your, your first book? What it is is just an updated version of the first book. The first book was only contained, uh, only concerned with um, uh, 10 years. And this book is concerned with 40 years. Uh -huh. So, you know, it's uh, uh, just imagine that other book times four so this is the full story yeah i mean you know it has uh, a lot of things that weren't in there you know the whole skinner thing mm -hmm. and uh the tubes and uh you know other dylan stuff it's quite a funny book i will look forward to that we have a title yet it'll probably be called um backstage passes and backstabbing bastards <laughs> i like it got a good ring i like that one you spent some time uh, working in the business and management side of the, the record industry as well, in A&R. Uh, do you think that experience helped you as a musician have a better understanding of, of how to deal with and work with record companies? How to deal with what? With, with working with record companies. Oh, it's, uh, it's always been a disaster for me. Yeah? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the reasons I stopped producing. It's because... Uh, uh, it's it's just so difficult to to just go in and and you know and do what you can do you know produce a record. There's so much extraneous uh, political garbage that goes hand in hand with it, and I don't have much tolerance for it. I wish that someone would just let me go in and produce a record and and you know and and leave me alone about the, these other things and and not butt into it. And it, and it just becomes, uh, uh, it's supposed to be fun, you know? Yeah, yeah. And if it's not fun, I don't want to do it. So consequently, I haven't been doing it. Fair enough. So what's the extent of your live work these days? You don't uh, play live a real lot, do you? Well, my parents are quite ill, so I can't really go very far. Mm -hmm. um, I have to be around, because I'm an only child, to uh, kind of watch over them. So I haven't been able to do as much as I, I want. I think the... I actually got to England last summer to play with uh, Dylan at Hyde Park. Oh, yes. Yeah. No, I mean, I had done that last year. And uh, uh, and that's really the furthest I've gotten. Usually I just play around New York and Nashville and now, I guess, Boston. But I play about four or five times a year in New York. Right. And um, I have a wonderful band now. The Recuperators. Yeah. Yeah, tell us a bit about them. Uh, well, it's, uh, everybody in the band plays on television except me. They're all on these, you know, late night talk shows. All right. Uh, the guitar player and the bass player are on this show called the Conan O'Brien Show. And, uh, and the drummer is on the, this show called the David Letterman Show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we get that one here. Oh, okay. And, uh... Uh, so, uh, you know, we can't really do extensive touring because they're on television every night. Right. So we mostly just play the weekends. Uh-huh. And there's another curious outfit you've been involved with, too, the Rock Bottom Remainers. Oh, uh, well, that doesn't exist anymore. Doesn't it? No. It was... So, uh, you know, that's that's over and done with. But uh, that was that was quite interesting while it lasted. And uh, what was that? That was made up of a whole lot of authors, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it was like a rock and roll fantasy camp. <laughs> it was a lot of fun, and I and I got to meet some really great people. Yeah, that, that I you know that I was uh, a fan of because I love to read. You also uh, like to write, and you've uh, written for movie and television as well in soundtracks. Which comes easier for you as a songwriter, writing in a soundtrack situation, or just writing songs for you for your own records? Well, it's two different heads. You really have to be two different kind of people to do that stuff. I mean, I have to... It takes me 
two weeks to warm up for the soundtrack thing. Mm -hmm. I have to just completely get into another musical personality to do that sort of thing. Whereas songwriting is more natural for me to do. The soundtrack work, you, you just have to get into another head. There, there are no rules, you know, and you're so used to following, you know, certain rules and when you write songs and stuff that uh, and then you have to, you know, break all the rules in order to do the soundtrack thing. So you have to just approach it from a whole other side. Right, okay. Um, you've done just about everything there is to do in rock and roll. Is there anything you haven't done that you'd like to do or anything you don't think you've done enough of yet? I'd, I'd like to... Um, I'd like to live with Claudia Schiffer for a year. <laughs> That'd be nice. Yeah. That's about it. Okay. Any uh, new studio uh, recordings in the works? Well, there's, there's quite a nice record out now under the guitar player's name, um, Jimmy Vivino. Mm -hmm. The guitar player in the Recuperators has an album out called uh, Do What Now by Jimmy Vivino and the Recuperators. And uh, that's a really, really nice blues album that we did in two days that uh, we're all very proud of. Excellent. And it, and it kind of shows the band off real nicely. That's good. Nothing in your own name uh, in, the, in the works at all? Uh, I, don't, I don't think I've made a record since 95. Uh, um, uh, I'm just... It's not a priority at the moment. Yeah. Um, I... I haven't made an album of, you know, original material in about 15 years. So, um, I mean, I really want very much to do that, but I don't know if the opportunity will exist for me to do that. Right. I think what I'll probably end up doing is, is uh, signing a deal for the Recuperators and we'll make Recuperator records, which will be like, you know, I'll sing three songs, Jimmy will sing three songs, and we'll play three instrumentals. Oh, yeah. Oh, be, you know, the, you know, like a real band record, and uh, uh, I think that's what what'll end up happening if somebody's smart enough to sign the recuperators. Oh, I'm sure there's someone out there smart enough to to see that. Listen, Al, I won't hold you up much longer. I know you got a lot on your plate. You're in a packing frenzy. So. I have a question. Yeah, sure. Uh, do you know uh, a gentleman by the name of Arnold Frollo's? Arnold Frollo's. No, I can't say I do. Okay. He was just a a guy that I knew in England who was Australian and then moved back to Australia and was involved in the music business. And uh, I just wondered if I could track him down. No, but, I, could, I could have a hunt around for you if you like and um, see if I can find out something for you. I'll certainly send you the results. Okay, good. Yeah, I'll do that. Okay, all the best in your, your move to Boston, Al. Okay. Hope thanks. it all goes smoothly and uh, we'll be in touch. I hope this has helped you out. It certainly has. Thanks very much for that. Okay. Okay, good luck. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.